you for that. I was really hoping it was going to be something big. <laughs> um, so Eric and I were asked to open up this morning and share with you uh, what the youth has been doing and what we've been making them do. No, I'm just kidding. They're doing it willingly, I hope. Okay. Um, so good morning again. We um, just had the lock-in on Friday night. We had a little youth service beforehand, and so what I would like to speak to before um, turning the mic over is the worship and the service afterward. I unfortunately didn't make it to the gym for the stay up all night long thing, um, but <laughs> on purpose. <laughs> um, but I was I was so blessed to be present during the um, worship service and then the the discussion sermon afterward. So I just want to say that the I was so impressed with the youth, the singers, the musicians, the worshipers. Um, it was a beautiful. It was a beautiful time for me to be to just be present and be witness to the hearts of of your youth, your your kiddos. Uh, they are so um, present in their worship, from the playing to the singing to um, just being in the in the audience. They were present. They were willing to praise the Lord, and there was no forcing. There was no, you got to do this or else. They wanted to praise the Lord. And so that was very, that pressed on my heart um, a, a big way. And so it was a blessing to me to be a part of that, that they um, that they let me lead them a little bit. And that in some ways they were leading each other and, and they were just having a great time with it. So I just want to thank the youth and I want to thank the parents for letting us have a hold of them. So Wednesday nights, Wednesday nights, um, we are, our, our goal is to be unashamed and bold in our faith. So not saying that they were, but um, if, there, if there was confusion there, we're introducing what it means to be unashamed of the gospel and to walk out in faith. So the message on Friday night was what can faith do? So I read to them. Matthew 17 20 where the disciples who were the followers of Jesus people that knew what Jesus could do and they knew his power they struggled in their own faith and these Jesus even called them out on it because they didn't believe in themselves enough to cast out a demon of a demon of a young child so when Jesus said okay I'll do it for you and he does it then he comes the disciples come and say how come we couldn't do it and it's because and Jesus says, it's because of your faith. You, you lacked some faith. So to go beyond that, the, the biggest thing for these guys and parents, if you can feed on this for us, I read to them Mark 2, where four men lowered their friend, who did not believe, to be healed. And Jesus said, because of their faith, you are healed. These guys are going into a world of confusion right now. And there's so much that the world is saying, this is okay and that's okay. And you shouldn't be, you shouldn't believe. You can't pray in school. You can't do this. The fact is you can. You can pray in school. You can lead prayer. Don't tell them that, don't let them tell you you can't. Because it's not against the law. It's against the law for administrators like ourselves to lead you in it. But you guys can do it, and I hope that you do. So, mini sermon, sorry. Um, but on Wednesday nights, if you have somebody 12 years old or older, up through senior year, bring them on Wednesday, 7 o'clock, and we will continue to approach being unashamed of the gospel and bold in our faith. So one more thing, we have our name and we have our logo presented there. Um, honor to one, so we're going to go by H2O. We will, because we are um, firm believers and we stand on the foundation of Jesus Christ, we will never thirst again. And so um, we are so thankful that this came to us um, through a, a youth discussion. This is what they came up with, and we were just so thankful that we were able to come up with something like that. So, yeah. 
Lord, for the worshipers in front of me. Lord, I want to pray over the, the um, speaking today, the speaker bringing the word, your word. Lord, let them open up and just be bright, bright words of you, of your redemption, of your power, of your strength. We thank you for all of that, Lord. Father God, for us to be able to be here, for us to be able to stand before you, to stand on your foundation is amazing. It's amazing every day. It's amazing that you allow us, that you that you get us going, that no matter what we falter in, no matter the failures that we allow ourselves to be a part of, you stand there, you walk with us, and you bring us back to you. So I just thank you, Lord, for your presence today. I thank you for you and love you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, you may be seated. Well, actually, turn around and greet someone before you do. And uh, it's good to see everyone today. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. What a great way to start hearing from our youth pastors, our new youth pastors, and we are so blessed. They did such a great job um, the other night and uh, excited for them and Grant and Ashley and all that God's doing in our youth group and uh, excited for just God's purpose in our youth. What a mission field that is. Amen. Talk about the youth. Wow. Um, Well, it is so good to see you all today. It's a very special Sunday. And uh, we're going to go ahead and take up our Sunday morning tithe and offering, if I could have those that are helping me with that. Um, Now, I'll just give you a little instruction. We have online giving, and this is the correct number. (laughs) Sorry, last week we had the incorrect number up there. Um, And uh, but we do have the correct number up this week. And if you uh, just text this number, text give, it'll send you a link and you can either go through that link. It's a secure link or you can just text whatever number it is that you want to give and it just automatically um, takes it from the account and that that you have already put in and uh, it uh, it just gives so you can just do it. it's very simple and easy but uh, that is our online giving and we can al- you can also do Venmo which is one assembly but um, how many are thankful for God's blessings amen, amen? over and over and over and um, you know we see God moving in our lives And sometimes we can struggle when it comes to finances, right? We can struggle. Um, And a lot of times it can be very difficult to give when there is a struggle in our finances. But what we have found, Anna and I have found, is that sometimes, many times, that is the time to give. Right? That's what the Word of God tells us is test me. (laughs) Test me and see my faithfulness. And we have seen that over and over in our lives and uh, so I want to encourage you to give as unto the Lord this morning and uh, because God is faithful and God is good. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Let's go ahead and pray over the offering. Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to give today. Lord, we just pray your blessing over it. We pray that it would be used for your glory, for your kingdom. Lord, for your purpose today, we give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Blessings flow. Praise Him. Praise Him for the wonders of His love. Amen. Thank you so much, worship team. Man, we are so blessed over and over. Well, as I mentioned, this is a very special Sunday. It is our Mission Sunday, and our focus this morning is missions. And uh, we, uh, we're we excited about that. And, and God is good. All the time. All the time. Amen. And as my husband, Pastor Nick, is sharing about being Mission Sunday, I wanted to share this just to connect you a little bit. Um, missions for me means 
the world. <laughs> it means a lot. And the reason is, is because I'm here in front of you today. I'm here because God is fulfilling the calling in my life. <laughs> yes. And the, uh, what he has placed in my life, and it's because I was in Guatemala. That's where I'm from. That's my beautiful country. And a missionary from here, from the U.S., uh, decided to give his heart and follow what God called him to do and went to Guatemala and started a church just with a tent in one of the small villages in, our, in my country. And one Sunday, I think some of you guys already know this story, but I wanted to share it again because a lot of you don't. And um, he was going to church with his wife and they passed his neighborhood. And the Lord just told him, stop right there, go house to house, door to door, and invite him to church. And he said, I question a little bit because he's like, I'm going, I'm going to church, I'll be late. You know, people are waiting for me. And the Lord told him again, stop, go door to door, and invite them to church. One of those houses was my parents. And that day that we're going to get, deciding to get divorced, my dad was addicted to alcohol. He had very heavy addictions, and my mom was pregnant with my older brother, so I wouldn't even be alive today mm. if it was not because of that missionary that decided to be obedient to the Lord that Amen. day Amen. and said, I'm going to stop at that house, and I'm going to invite him to church. My mom said yes that day. She went to church. She got saved. Months later, my dad got saved. And now my parents have been pastors for 40 years serving the Lord. <laughs> and now I'm here standing in front of you because of a missionary. And I know that he was not all by himself. There was a support behind him that made it possible for him to be there. Amen. So that's what makes it so powerful that maybe physically we're not there, church, but in heart. In heart, we are there. It's a special connection. So I just wanted to share that yeah. as the Lord leads us for Mission Sunday. And something interesting, that same missionary uh, was actually one of the officiants. He wasn't meant to be. He was a translator. But he, was, he became one of the officiants in our wedding. And uh, when they prayed over us, he spoke a prophetic word over our lives that is still walking out today. And uh, man, incredible how God works, isn't it? And I wanted to share a little bit. You know, I was one of those kids. You know that you, when you go to concerts and things like that, you can sponsor kids? I was one of those. Hmm. For, I think, five, six years, I had a family that sponsored me and my brothers for a little bit to help us financially yeah. to survive and to do what God called my family to do in the ministry. So it's, it's just a powerful thing. You never know what God can do. And then they came as a missionary family to the U.S. Yeah. And her dad is still working as a Spanish pastor down in New Orleans. Unbelievable. <laughs> wow. Um, how God works. So we're excited. This is our Mission Sunday. And if my voice sounds a little fun funky, I don't know what's going on, but uh, I'm good. And uh, I'm here. But uh, we're uh, excited to introduce. We have been investing into missionaries and um some of you may not be aware of that, but we want to introduce our missionaries to you today and uh, just, uh, just lives that we're investing into every month that as a church we give. And uh, we, so go ahead and start rolling that, Brendan. Uh, go to the next one there. Um, this is Justin Canavan. He's a missionary to China and uh, he's a blessing to us. Go ahead and go to the next one. Just keep on. Bradley and Car Huh? Japan. Okay. Bradley and Car uh, Carrie Keller, they're Youth Alive. We support them monthly. Kevin Kapler, Emergency Services. And uh, then we have Derek and Natalie Lynn, Kai Alpha. Terry and Babs Castleberry, these are missionaries to Belize. We have the Davises, Native American missionaries. We have Sean and Megan Deal missionaries to Uganda. We have the Elliots, missionaries to Wales. We have the Georges, intercultural mis ministries. We have the Gazwas, uh, Chi Alpha missionaries. The Grays, missionaries to Italy. We have the Marshes, international ministries. We have the Thomases, missionaries to Vanuatu. 
We have the Turnies missionaries to Asia Pacific, and Abby and Alicia missionaries to India. Come on. <laughs> Um, we give, we give every month, and um, we invest into these missionaries, and uh, man, it's, we are rebuilding our missions program, and that is what God is doing in our church, and so we're excited, and so this morning, it's all about just making you aware and allowing you, uh, if you're not already investing into the missions, to begin to invest, and this is uh, above and beyond your necessarily tie that you give into the church, this is towards our missions and our missions program. And so um, we're excited about that. And then we have also another special announcement uh, that is coming up. We have in September, we are going as a church, we have several of us that are going to Guatemala. <laughs> that is our mission trip as a church. That is a mission trip that we will be going in September. So we will, we're will we going to let you know more opportunities that you can be part of to support the team that's going to go. We will be introducing the team. It's really exciting because we have youth, part of our youth uh, that is going to be there with us in ministry as well. So we will let you know more information on that. But let's keep us in, a, in your prayers. If you notice in the foyer, we put, the, there's two flags, India and Guatemala. But we'll be adding all the missionaries that you saw today. We're going to have, that's going to be our missionary wall, Mish, missions wall, that makes more sense. But um, we're, I just wanted to let you know, if you see those boxes there, that, the red boxes, they give you the opportunity. Hey, anytime you feel the spirit leading you to give, leading you to support you don't have to wait for a specific Sunday you could always give and support for those uh, missionaries that we have there on the wall right now amen we're excited about that and uh, we're excited to have more missions trips in the future and so if you're interested in going on a missions trip please reach out let us know um, because there will be more uh, coming in the future so um, well this morning we have a very special man he has been a blessing to me ever since I remember moving up here into Salem, Missouri, and uh, getting to know Brother Stan. He is uh, just a man that invests into other pastors and loves to do it. And uh, we've had some interesting times in the past, haven't we, Brother Stan? <laughs> and uh, he, uh, he's just, he's there whenever you need him. And um, his heart is missions. He leads our missions program in the Southern Missouri Network. And um, he also is our secretary, and he, he's just a rock. You can ask so many other pastors. He's a rock in faith. He is a rock in missions, and uh, he, we, we love him so much. Would you give Brother Stan Welch a big hand as he comes this morning? this iPad, I always have to make sure that it's on the right direction. Come on. I got lights on. There's nobody home. You hear me? I just don't hear me. Now, there we go. There we go. If you turn this iPad the wrong way, you turn it on the button and Siri will talk to you. So I'm getting ready to preach one day and I've got it turned upside down and I begin to preach and Siri says I don't understand you well that was funny the first time but when I start off again Siri says again I don't understand you and then finally I figured out I had it turned upside down but I did think maybe that's how some of the people out there are sitting and thinking I don't understand you well I hope you understand me today that my heart is thrilled to see this building full of people to congratulate your pastors for the wonderful job they do here. Can you give the Lord a hand clap of appreciation for giving you such wonderful gifts of these pastors? And then I want to thank you for your continued faithful support to missionaries. And without missionaries, we cannot do the Great Commission. 
It's wonderful to have projects and drill wells and build buildings and, and feed children and do a lot of things, but if we don't have missionaries on the ground, it doesn't work. So a couple things I want you to do. I want you to take that card that was sitting on your your seat there. Everybody take that card. That's your card. Say, that, say this is my card. So what I want you to do is find you a pen, a pen and write your name on the card. I want all God's children to write their name on the card. You don't have to write any money. God doesn't talk to you. You don't have to do anything. But if God does, I want you to respond and I want this to be a point of contact so that God can speak to you about your giving. Before I preach, I want to tell a story. I love your story about missions. See, missions is not about just faraway places and, and different worlds. Missions about people, about people that didn't know Jesus but now do I brought my club because I was close to St. Louis and you never know what you might need and so uh, but let me tell you a little story about this club a few years ago I had the opportunity to go to Vanuatu one of your missionaries the Thomases are in Vanuatu Vanuatu is an island chain of 85 islands in the South Pacific if you ever want to go to Vanuatu, what you do is get on a plane, fly to Los Angeles, get on Fiji Airlines, fly to Fiji, and then you take a left. And 1,200 miles off of the coast of Brisbane, Australia, is this island chain. And so we got to go over there and do some neat things. And one of the things that we did was I got the invitation to preach district council on the island of Santos, in Vanuatu I thought well sure I'll preach district council because what that means in most places around the world is that pe the churches and the ministers come together and they have a service they take care of their business they usually go to the biggest town with the biggest church well on the island of Santos the biggest town is 4500 but they had a nice church and that's where they normally had district council but not the year I was there. They decide to take district council to the bush. Now, the bush meant a long ways from anywhere. And this is the story. This is how it started. We got ready to go to this village, and they, the first thing we did, we got into a speed the light truck. Do you young people know what speed the light is? Okay. One guy shook his head. The other guy said, never heard such a thing. Speed the light is what our young people give to help our missionaries have vehicles, PA systems, whatever they need to speed the light of the gospel. So we got into a speed the light truck. Honest, this is where, where we, and we turned on to George Bush Highway. Honest, there's a road in Vanuatu called George Bush Highway because when he was president, he gave them money to build a highway. So they named it after him. So we take down George Bush Highway. We turn left on a gravel road, which eventually turns into a path. Now, they told me we're going to cross the ocean. Now, this is what was in my mind. We're going to go to a pier. We're going to walk up this big gangplank, and we're going to get into a ship. Doesn't that sound reasonable to you if you're going to cross the ocean? I was quite surprised when I looked out on the bank and pulled up on the bank was an 18-foot V-bottom aluminum boat. It had a 35-horse Mercury, and there were 10 of us in that boat, plus chickens and plus some rocks. I looked at the missionary, and I said, why are we loading rocks? I looked at us, I looked at the boat, I looked, we had some luggage in there because we're going to be in that village for a week. And I'm thinking, we sure don't need rocks. But he explained to me these rocks were special. They didn't split in the fires, so they cooked off of these rocks. So get your mind, here we are, 10 of us in this boat, 
we take across Big Bay in the ocean. They encouraged me. They said, oh, the, the waves aren't bad today. We've just got seven and eight foot swells. Now, I want you to imagine seven, eight foot swells, 35 horse mercury. You don't go on top of anything. You're on wham, wham. Now, that boat did not have seats. It had metal benches. Those metal benches have left an impression on me that I may still have to this day. And for three hours, three hours, after a while, the theme to Gilligan's Island starts going through my mind. We're out in the South Pacific. It's just a beautiful place, but we're riding through those waves. And finally, they tell me, we're here. Well, here didn't look like much because when I got, I looked on the bank and there was about three or four huts and I thought, well, it's not much, but it's better than here and I'm ready to get out. So they turned that boat around, put the motor toward the bank. We waited for a big, big wave and they washed us up on the bank. We got out and there were guys from the village was there to meet us. And I soon found out that we weren't there yet. We had a five-mile hike through the jungle to go. And so we take off through, first thing we go through is coconut groves. They, they grow lots of coconut there. Coconut groves are beautiful, but you never know when a coconut's going to fall. I had one to miss me about that far. So five-mile hike, we end up in this picturesque village. Imagine a South Pacific village, thatch huts. There's a mountain in the background. There's a crystal clear river running at the base of that mountain, and there is a village built right there on it. And when we get there, they announce the white guys are here. Now, there was no electricity there, but the chief of that village had a megaphone and he announced that the white guys were there, and he told them which outhouse we used. We had our own outhouse. It was great. No, it wasn't great, but it was <laughs> because when you went, you always made a lot of noise so the bugs would kind of leave a little bit. And then they made us a shower. Now, the shower was this thatch little building that was made out of coconut leaves, and the only thing about that, you could really see out of it well. Just think about it. Well, and they built it right next to where the ladies cooked. <laughs> and the shower consisted of a big bowl of water with a little bowl in it. And you poured that water. After that trip, it was time for a shower. So our days consisted of, in the morning, we met with the pastors. Now, there were... 500 to 600 people extra in that village because they had all walked in just like we did because there was no road there. And we, in the morning, we, we did a training with the pastors. In the afternoons, they did their business. And at night, we did a crusade. So we're preaching in the jungle. They had brought in a generator and a PA system on horseback. So we got this one light sitting out there and a light up on the, the stage. And folks overseas, a lot of folks overseas believe that God is death. Now, why do you say that? They only run the PA one way, wide open. And if it's not squealing every once in a while, they don't think it's on. So we're out in the middle of the jungle preaching, PA squealing. Every once in a while, generator would go down, it'd go dark. But we'd keep preaching, and it'd come back on. And we seen scores of people get saved, baptized in the Holy Spirit. It was, a, it was a time that I'll never forget. So we get ready to leave, and I'm getting to the club. I just want to set the stage for you. So we're getting ready to leave, and <coughs> we're going to, uh, we, gave, we gave them some money to build a new church there because their old church had been hit with a typhoon. It was about to fall down. We're standing by the rock where that church is going to be built. And they're going through ceremonies and thanking us for being there. And the chief of the village comes with this club in his hand. 
Now, when he came, you can see there used to be streamers hanging down from this club. And he stepped up to me, and through an interpreter, this is what he said, and it changed my life. I, I've never viewed missions again the same. He held this club out, and he looked me right in the eye and said, if you would have came here just a few years ago, when you stepped on our territory, I would have met you with this club, and I would have killed you. Strange things will go through your mind while you're standing in the South Pacific among a group of people that are the last recorded cannibals on the planet. This honestly went through my mind, <laughs> and I thought, yeah, you would have hit me, and you would have eat me, <laughs> and you would have thought, happy days are here again. We really do like white meat, and <laughs> this is going to be Standing next to me was Brother Curtis Washam. You know Brother Curtis. He's our camp director. Now, I'm healthy. I've wintered well, you know, so they had plenty to eat with me. Curtis... He's not just skinny, he's bony. I thought they wouldn't even bothered with you. They'd have sent you home to tell Sherry what happened to me. But it, then he looked me in the eye and he said these words that changed my life. He looked at me, held this club up and said, but you sent a missionary. Well, I didn't by myself sent a missionary to Vanuatu. But just like you, you partnered with others who sent a missionary who went into places that they put their life on the line to take the gospel. And he said that missionary told us about a God that loved us so much that he sent his own son to die for us. And then with a big smile on his face, he lifted this club and he said, Now you are my brother. And we wrapped our arms around each other. And because of that, I believe in the monthly support of missionaries. Thank you for supporting missionaries on a monthly basis. Thank you for what you do. So what I'm here to challenge you to do is to become involved in missions on a monthly basis. Now, Brother Stan, I don't know if I can do that or not. Just let God talk to you, okay? And whatever he says will be good. Everybody okay with that? God speaks to you. Do what he says. It'll be good. I want to take a few moments from the Word of God, and I want to share with you out of Matthew chapter Eight, a story of the healing of the centurion's servant. And when I read this, you're going to think, where in the world is he going to get missions out of this? But stay with me. Matthew chapter 8, verse 5. And when he had entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terrible. And he said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you to come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. And when Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, Truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come from the east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into outer darkness in a place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And to the centurion, Jesus said, Go, let it be done for you, as you have believed and the servant was healed at that very moment as you study the miracles of Jesus and I've been preaching through the miracles of Jesus on Wednesday night for several months now uh, my wife passed
preachers, and I'm her Wednesday night preacher. So I'm preaching through the miracles of Jesus. And uh, I have noticed something, that as you watch the miracles of Jesus, you will begin to see the heart of God and the mission of God. And in this miracle of the healing of the servant of the centurion, I see God's heart for missions. There are three things I learn about the mission of God from this miracle. First thing I learn is Jesus, there's a world full of people that cannot get to Jesus on their own. There's a world full of people that can't get to Jesus on their own. Number two, I learned there must be people willing to plead the cause of others and get them to experience Jesus. And the third thing I learned is that when we move toward others, God will move toward us. So three things I want to talk to you about. God's mission isn't being fulfilled because in many people's lives because they can't get to Jesus on their own. It says, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. Luke said that the, he came and said, my servant is sick at the point of death, and I love him dearly. God's mission plan to save the world is clearly seen. We sang it in one of your songs when we sang John 3.16. It says in John 3.14, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes on him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son in the world to condemn the world, but the world through Him might be saved. God is not slow concerning His promises, but He's patient, not wishing that any, how many should perish? None, but all come to repentance. The purpose of God is to see the world saved. How many believe that? I don't believe that you and I are some little special group that God says, you're my favorites. I like you better than anybody else in the world. And so, therefore, I'm going to let you go to heaven and all these other folks die and go to hell. But why aren't more people being reached with the gospel than they are? First, because people on their own can't get to Jesus. What do you mean? This slave of this centurion soldier, Roman soldier, could not get to Jesus on his own. Why? Let's look at some of the reasons. First, he was limited physically. He was paralyzed at the point of death. You don't get up and run around <laughs> when you're paralyzed and at the point of death. There was no way that this guy was going to get up and meet Jesus in the city that day. Not only was he physically limited, he was socially limited. He was a slave. Slavery is a terrible thing, but because of man's fallen heart, it's always been a part of mankind. This man was owned. This man couldn't go where he wanted to go and do what he wanted to do. He was controlled by somebody else. We live in a world that's not free. The God of this world has blinded them to the truth of the gospel. He was limited physically, socially. He was spiritually limited. He was lying at home. He had never heard the words of Jesus. He had never experienced what it was to feel the Spirit. He had never been in a worship service and felt God move while people sang the songs of Zion. So he is limited spiritually. There are billions, I said billions, of people that cannot get to Jesus on their own. They will live and die 
and never hear his name one time. They will, their next generation will live and die and never hear his name one time. Well, Brother Stan, that doesn't seem right. I don't think it's right at all. So, shouldn't God do something about it? I think he has. He saved us. And he gave us a commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Well, Brother Stan, isn't that kind of a heavy load? Yes, it's a real heavy load. So we must understand there are people who cannot get to Jesus unless somebody helps them. That's why we do missions. That's why we send missionaries. That's why there needed to be a missionary walking the road in Honduras and getting a quickening of the Spirit that says stop here and knock on doors. That's why we must send somebody to go. Well, Brother Stan, that's a big thing you're laying on me. I want you to repeat this after me. I can't do everything, but I can do everything I can. We're going to say that again. I can't do everything, but I can do everything I can. The problem is because we can't do everything, sometimes we don't do anything. In southern Missouri that you're a part of, we have 200 and probably around 40, 240 missionary units. One assembly in Herculaneum probably can't send them all to the field. At least not right now. But you know what you need to do? Everything you can. You need to have a clear conscience for God saying, I can't do everything, but I can do everything I can because people can't get to Jesus. There are thousands upon thousands of people groups. That's people that have a same culture, speak a same language, that will live and die and never meet one Christian. People can't get to Jesus unless somebody helps them get to Jesus. So that's why we must become involved. Billions of people have never heard a clear presentation of the gospel. They are limited physically, socially, spiritually, and informationally. They are paralyzed in their sins. Somebody needs to go and tell them. Point two. For God's mission to be fulfilled, there must be those that are willing to plead the cause of these people, no matter the cost. God's plan was to bring salvation is dependent upon our willingness to share the gospel. Jesus, after he was resurrected in Mark 16, he appeared unto the, the eleven that were reclining at the table and he rebuked them because of their unbelief and their hardness of heart because they had not believed those that had seen him after he was risen. And he said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. That's the mandate of the church. If Coca-Cola can be everywhere on the planet, I've been a lot of places on this planet, and I've never been where Coca-Cola was not there. You could get a Coke anywhere. I think people ought to have a chance to get Jesus anywhere on this planet. The centurion is an example of someone moved by the needs of others and did what was necessary to save his servant from a life of suffering that would soon end in death. The centurion's quest for a miracle was an act of fulfilling God's mission. The only way to fulfill God's mission is to release the miraculous power of God into people's lives. It is the mission of God to seek and save the lost. Jesus said, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Fulfilling 
The mission of God is dependent upon our willingness to do our part. You got that card in your hand? What would God say to you to give in faith for the next 12 months? I don't think he'll say anything to me. Oh, yes, he will if you'll listen. Yes, he will. Because he wants to use you just like he used that centurion. Fulfilling the mission of God is dependent on the condition of our heart toward those that are in need. There's three things that we need to have in our heart if we're going to fulfill God's mission. First, the centurion had a heavy heart because he understood the servant's need. He said, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. He's at the point of death. And he says, I love him. He's valuable to me. The servant was very dear to him. He had been sick for a long time. And the centurion took his pain and began to feel it and began to say, I've got to do something. I don't know about you, but sometimes when those commercials come on and they're trying to raise money for little kids with swollen bellies, have you ever flipped the channel? Because it sure don't make you feel good. But let me tell you something, friend. When we think of the lostness of humanity, it doesn't make me feel very good. But I have to take the heaviness of the situation. I've got to say with a heavy heart, it's not God's will that any perish. How do I have a right to hear the gospel thousands of times when people have never heard? I have to do my part. I've got to get moved. I must have a heavy heart. There is always pressure and heaviness if we truly care for people. Some folks want to come to church and they want to get a little religious buzz and oh, wasn't that good and don't I feel good? Now don't talk to me about anything. I don't want any responsibility. I'll show back up at church when I'm ready. I got a news for you. You haven't become a follower of Jesus. Because Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. Jesus said, you must die daily to yourself. And you must sense the heaviness of a lost world without Jesus. The centurion had a heavy heart. Is your heart heavy? When you see thousands of people around you dying without God. So to do this mission, we have to have a heavy heart. Secondly, we must have a humble heart. Centurion did. When Jesus said, I'll come, he was so humble. He said, I'm not worthy of you. Too many of us think God's kind of given us a short change because we're really worthy of more than we're getting. Can I get a witness? God, if you was a good God, you would answer my prayers just like I pray them. And God, what's wrong with you? You know, a lot of our prayer life is spent on telling God what he should do instead of trying to get ourselves in line with God. This centurion got it. I'm not worthy. I have no rights to demand anything from God. What I have, I have by grace and grace alone. And I humbly submit myself to the will and the way of God. God, if you can use anyone, use me. God, I'm humbled before you. Lord, you did. when Jesus saved me, he didn't get a deal. He really got the short end of this thing. I didn't have anything to offer him but a life messed up, marked by sin, but he has given me everything. And so if I'm going to help people, I must have a heaviness over their needs and I must have a humility toward God that says, Lord, use me, but I'm not worthy. This man could have been arrogant, this centurion. He was a part of an occupying army. 
he, the Romans were in charge. He was in charge of at least a hundred soldiers. It could have been a thousand. He knew what it was to give orders and people respond. But when he met Jesus, his heart humbled and said, I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof. And thirdly, he had a heart that was under authority. He said, Jesus, I'm a man under authority. I understand authority. When Rome gives me an order, I do it. And when I give an order, I expect my soldiers to do it. And Jesus, all you have to do is speak the word and my servant will be healed. <coughs> For he understood the authority of God. The, at the heart of the centurion's faith was an understanding of the authority of God. The centurion recognized Jesus for who he really was. Jesus marveled at his faith. He said, I can't find folks in Israel with an understanding of who I am and what I can do. We must be totally convinced of the authority of Christ. How many believe Jesus is the head of the church? He's in charge. So when he gives an order, we ought to believe it and obey it, correct? What was his last order to the church? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's the standing order of the church. You want to know what you're all about here at this church? Is You are a worldwide missions outreach. If you look at yourself as anything but that, you have not heard the command of Christ and you have not submitted to authority. The authority is for you to go to your Jerusalem, your Judea, your Samaria, and then to the uttermost parts of the world. You will have the anointing of the Holy Spirit to accomplish that. So he had a heavy heart. He had a humbled heart, and he had a heart that's under authority. Somebody needs to say, my goodness, it's not right that people die and go to hell and never hear the gospel. That upsets me, Brother Stan. And then you humbly say, oh, God, I'm not, I can't demand anything, but please use me. Please use me for your glory. And then I need a heart that understands his authority and respond to his command to go. And number three, the third thing that this miracle teaches me is that Jesus will move when we ask. He came to him and said, would you come and heal my servant? And Jesus said, I will come and heal him. And you know what Jesus did? He turned toward his house. God's moving around this world. In the book of Numbers, there was a time that God told Moses, said, I want you to feed the people. It's in Numbers 11, I believe. And I won't read it, but let me paraphrase the story. Moses says to God, I got 600,000 foot soldiers plus all the other folks. He said, if I could catch all the fish of the sea, if I butchered every animal in our flocks and herds, I couldn't feed them. And you tell me to feed them? I've told you there are billions and billions of people without God. And now I'm telling you, you should reach them. And you're saying, well, how in the world can you do that? Let me tell you the rest of this story. While God's telling Moses to feed the people, God starts an east wind blowing. And what happens? All the quail. How many of y'all ever eat quail? Good, isn't it? The rest of you folks are missing something. And God begins to blow an east wind. And he says to all the quail of the region, get together, because you're about to show up 
in the Israelites camp and if you read that story that east wind blew in those quail about three foot high off the ground they knocked quail down they caught quail they they had quail they had more meat than they knew what to do with because listen when God makes a promise I want you to know God is moving on the other end I said, when God tells you to do something, God is stirring other places in the world. God is stirring. If God's telling you to go see your neighbor, go see your neighbor because God's already working on the other end. If you want to do something for God, God wants to do something through you. When this centurion, Roman soldier, not a part of the covenant of promise, hated by the Jews because of who he was, when Jesus, when he asked Jesus to come, Jesus moved that way. I got good news. Jesus is moving around the world. Let me look at what time it is. I'll quit here in a second. I was right before COVID. That's how we divide time now. I was in India, in Chennai, India. We had went over to to see what a Bible school was doing. We were investing in that Bible school. They had told us if we give $100 per student, that student will come to our Bible school and that student will plant a church. I'm from Missouri. I hear a lot of stuff, but <laughs> can really $100 produce a church? So they invited us to come and see. And I saw that not only was it that student planting one church, but they were planting it in Hindu neighborhoods and when they would plant it in the home and when that church would get up to about 25 to 30, they would split and plant another one because it was against the law so they couldn't get too big. And instead of one, it was multiple churches being planted. And so we got to see that and enjoy that. And we got to preach on the Sunday before we left at New Life Assembly of God in Chennai, India, runs over, well over 50,000 on a Sunday. First service is at 5.30 a.m. That's before daylight, folks. Thankfully, I didn't get the 5.30 service. Can I get a witness? There were nine of us. They had nine services, so we all had a different service. I got the 8.30 service. So we had... All the guys had preached, and, and we were going to have lunch together at a hotel we were staying at. And there were about six or seven of us back from the church. There were still two or three still having services, hadn't made it back from the church. And so when you get preachers together, preachers love to talk. Can you get a witness? Your preacher loves to talk, doesn't he? he just, I watch him online every once in a while. He, he does well. So we're sitting around waiting for these other guys, and so we begin to talk about our services that we had at this great church. So we're all telling what we preached and what had happened. and So it comes to me. Now, they had told us when we got to India, be careful what you say. This is a Hindu country. It is against the law to evangelize. You must watch your words. So we were real careful for a while, but you know after you're there for a while you get comfortable. So we're sitting there and it came to me and I began to tell them what I preached. I preached that day on what happened right after this miracle. Jesus is, and, the, and a crowd is walking toward Nan and this crowd of great life because this guy had been healed and such excitement and they're walking along and out of Nain, a little town, comes a funeral procession. A widow's only son had died and these two groups collide. So my sermon that day was when life and death collide. So I told those preachers my three points because I figured they could preach it better try it again you know I'm always open to listen to a good sermon outline and so when when I get through with my little sermon outline 
I get a tap on my shoulder. And the waiter says, sir, there's a man that wants to see you. It comes back to my mind. They told us to be quiet. And my voice carries. And those other preachers were so encouraging. As I got up to follow the waiter to go to this man that wanted to see me, a couple of them said, we'll tell Sherry that we saw you when they took you. So I get up, I follow the waiter to a table against the wall. And there sat a man who lived in that hotel, and that man was blind. And he heard me tell about Jesus being greater than the power of death. And he said to me, Sir, is there really a God that is greater than the power of death? See, the Hindus serve 33 million different gods that are not gods. So none of them are greater than the power of death. And I could tell that man, yes, there is a God that is greater than the power of death. Why did I tell you that story? Because God was moving to make sure that all those things would be together that day, that we would sit at that table, and when we, it got my turn to tell about what I preached, that a man who did not know about Christ could hear of a God greater than the power of death. Let me tell you, if you'll invest in missions, God is moving all around the world. In the Islamic world today, more people are being born again today than in the history of, since Islam has been formed. God is still moving. In Iran, there is a powerful revival today. God is moving. God is not limited by our politics. God is not limited by our stupidity. God is still God, and He's still saving people. And if we'll get involved, God will move. The reaction of Jesus to the centurion's request for his servant was to move. The second reaction was to marvel. He said, I've never found faith like this in all of Israel. He marveled at the centurion's ability to understand spiritual authority. Everybody look at me. It's time for we American Christians to grow up. Square our shoulders, lift our heads, and begin to walk in the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ and understand life is not all about us. It's about others. And there's billions of people that need the right to hear about Jesus. He marveled at the inability of the Jewish leaders to see his authority. If we understand the authority of Jesus to save, to heal, and set free those that are in bondage, God will look at us and marvel at us. And then Jesus mourned. He mourned over the lack of faith of people that should have had faith. The people that have been raised on the Word of God, raised on the promises of God, who had generations of God miraculously moving, could not have faith when God sent his son. Folks, I don't want God mourning over us. Can I get a witness? Sometimes I think he looks at our churches and he says, You're, we're caught up with everything but what I'm concerned about. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. And then the final response Jesus met the servant's need. The centurion said, Lord, if you'll speak the word, he'll be healed. And Jesus said, let it be so. And the Bible says that same hour, he was healed. If this church will plug into the heart of God, if you will understand, there is a world full of people that can't get to Jesus on their own. Tens of thousands of people drive in front of your church and they don't even know it's here. Well, we got a sign out there, Brother Stan. They're not looking for you. 
The God of this world has blinded them. Do you know how you're going to get them? You've got to go to them. You've got to take personal responsibility. You've got to get a heaviness in your heart. You've got to have a humble heart. And you've got to understand the authority of God. And you must understand there will be people that will die and go to hell and they can't get to Jesus if we don't get Jesus to them. Amen? Somebody's got to be willing to plead the cause. That day when that centurion, with all of his hang-ups, with all of his problems, heard that Jesus was coming to town, he said, I'm not going to let my servant that I love die without me doing everything I can to get the hope of Jesus to him. Would to God that something would stir within us and say we're not going to let people die and go to hell without doing our part. And I promise Jesus will respond to your act of faith. Amen? I want you to take this card in your hand. Now, here's what we're asking. This is what this is all about, so that you understand completely. I'm not coming here and taking a dime from you. I'm not asking. This, all, this response is not for that, this money to be controlled by somebody beside you all. This money will be put together so that you can make the decisions there are more missionaries that we need to support. There are more needs that we need to fund. But how are you going to be able to do that? People just like you are going to say, once a month, I'm going to give above my tithe what God tells me to give. Does that sound reasonable? Now, how many believe God knows your name? Knows where you live? He's got your debit card down. He does. Knows your checking account, your credit cards. So I believe God can speak to you. Let me tell you a couple things that has happened while I've been doing things like this. Probably about three months ago, I was at a little town called Purdy. Anybody ever been to Purdy? Well, if you go to Springfield, go west, you'll go to Mon Monette and turn south. And there's a little town of about 15, 1,600, small church. I'm there doing a faith promise service just like this. And I'm telling people, okay, ask God what he'd have you to give. And there's a lady that attends that church and, and, and kind of one of these people that are homesteaders. You know what? You've seen them on TV, and they're kind of disconnected, and they, they don't operate with much money, and she's got 10 kids. So you really can't have any money with 10 kids. Can I get a witness? <laughs> and so she's got this card in her hand, and she's begun to fill out this faith promise, and she writes $10. And the pastor tells me this story, later, and he said $10 for her was an enormous amount of money. But she heard the voice of God, not Stan Welch, not her pastor, but God said, I want you to add another zero. And she tells the story. I laughed. <laughs> I said, $100 a month? I can't do that. But in her heart, she felt it was God. She added that other zero. That's been about nine months, I believe now, seven to nine months. I seen her pastor last month. And he comes up and he tells me this story. This lady is the most excited lady in my church. Because every mission Sunday, she's just waiting for a miracle. For each month, a provision. She doesn't have it. She can't save it up. But God makes a provision. You say, now, Brother Stan, that wouldn't happen for me. Well, you don't ever know until you put it to test. Amen? Now, don't do anything God doesn't tell you. Don't write some silly number down. 
Listen to the voice of God. I was preaching at a, at a large church doing faith promises, and in the balcony of that church, there was a lady that felt impressed of God to double her missions giving over the last year. She owned a business. She was, she was giving a lot of money to missions. And God said to double it. Well, that's all well and good, but she had just retired. Now she is making 25% of what she was making. But she hears the voice of God. She writes it down. Now, here, this is her testimony, not mine. I didn't have anything to do with it. But on Monday morning, she checked her bank account, and to the penny, there had been deposited that, that amount that she had doubled. Oh, brother Stan, that wouldn't happen for me. I don't know if it would have done. But you'll never have a miracle until you listen to God. Now, there's no wrong amount to write down. The only wrong amount is no amount because I really believe God wants every child of God to give to missions. Wouldn't you think that would be re reasonable? Since somebody gave the mission so you could be here. Amen? So we want to help others. Right now, there's not a great amount of money that's coming in on a monthly basis. But I believe this is going to be a springboard. Amen? I believe that you're going to hear the voice of God. Write down. Has everybody got a pen? I'll borrow somebody who can share it with you. <laughs> if you need a pen. I want you to write down what God would have you to give for the next 12 months on a monthly basis. When you do that, you'll see two little boxes right here. One says new and one says renew. If you've been giving to missions, check that box, renew. If you've not been giving to missions on a monthly basis, everybody smile at you. That doesn't mean you're a bad person. That just means, hey, this is a new day, new start. Mark that box new. If you have been giving to missions, but you want to increase what you're giving, mark renew and new. Okay? Can you do that? Now, do that right now, because if you wait, the moment will pass you. This is a time you need to respond to the Lord right now. And then when you leave, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take this and tear and keep this part. Right on this part, little part right here, this is what God has told me to give on a monthly basis. Okay? Take that with you. I tell this to be humorous so everybody laugh. This is an com upcoming joke. Are you ready? Take this and put this one of two places. Either in the cover of your Bible or on your refrigerator door. Whichever you open the most. Mine's on my refrigerator door. Joke. Okay, I warned you, so you did well. Why I want you to do that is not so you look at it and say, Oh, I'm not doing what God told me. No. What I want you to do is every time you look at it, you say, God, you told me. I'm not doing this because I thought it up. You spoke it to me. So you helped me. And I believe that your pastor is going to call me one of these days and he's going to tell me some testimonies from your life where you stepped out in faith and God miraculously provided to you. We're going to pray. Heavenly Father, guide and direct these people. Would you shift in the lives of these people today and let them begin to see and take the responsibility that there are people that will die without God if they don't do something. Now they can't do everything, but they can do everything they can. Guide them, give them direction, and use them for your glory. Thank you, Lord, for what they have done and their willingness to continue to give. Bless this church. Make it a light to this area. God, 
this church you called and destined not only to touch this area but to touch the world God make it a great church on a mission for you and God's people said amen and amen thank you God bless you amen amen wow appreciate brother Stan if the worship team could come You know, I need to tell you something this morning. Our heart here at One Assembly is to make sure you know that you matter. Did you know that? You matter. Did you know that? You don't seem very excited about that. <laughs> but you matter. You matter to God. That's incredible. I matter. My family matters. You matter to God. Did you know that? If you didn't know that, you need to know that. Your life matters. But the point of missions is that not just our lives matter, every single one matters. Right? And so that means the orphan living over in India that doesn't have food to eat and even a place to sleep, he matters. That's what missions is about, that every single one matters. And so we're going to invest into their lives. We're getting invest into those that are going to go where we're not going to go, right? Because they matter. So would you stand with me this morning as we go into worship? I'm aware of the time. If you need to leave, you can leave. But we're going to, this time we take as precious we recognize that our God is so special. Brother Stan spoke of the Hindus that worship 33 million gods. There is no God like our God. And that our God is involved. Our God was willing to lay his life down for us. And so as we enter into worship this morning, man, do we just close our eyes? Jesus, we just take this time right now, God. And Lord, we let this message, God, we just let it begin to move in our hearts, Lord, as we enter into your presence, as we welcome you, Holy Spirit to just come and just exalt and magnify the name that's above every name, the name of Jesus, God. And Lord, I know there are those here that are struggling, God, and it's hard for them to even get their eyes onto someone else because they're dealing with such a struggle in their own life. But God, as we lift our eyes upon you today, God, as we turn our eyes on Jesus, and we get our eyes off of ourselves and our struggles and our battles and, and whatever we're going through today, God. And we turn our eyes upon you, Jesus. We just pray that you would give us a heart for those. Lord, those billions that have never heard your name, that do not know of your love, that do not know of your grace, that do not know that you love them so much that you were willing to die for them, God. And Lord, we just lift them up today, God. Jesus, we worship you, Lord. Jesus, we worship you. Come on, church. Oh, we worship you. We adore you, God. We magnify your name above every other name, Jesus. Come on. Come on. Oh, we worship, we worship, we worship you, Lord. <laughs> Oh, Jesus, oh, we give you glory, give you honor, give you praise today. Oh, there's no other name, there's no other name than the name of Jesus. Oh, you're good, you're good, you're good, God. <laughs> oh, we worship you. Come on, church, worship him today. He's worthy, he's worthy.
time, Waymaker. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Woo! Shut down all my say. Oh, you are God. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Oh, yeah. Yes, Lord. Shida basoha kayemandak. Shana na mandere eita darabaso. Yeheki hi ababa bro. Come on, let's just keep pressing in. Don't give up here. Come on. We're about to press through. Oh, that is who you are, God. Glorious, 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 glorious. Yeah. That is who you are. Let's sing this. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Woo! Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. Never stop. Never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Never stop, you never stop 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 working. You never stop working. Way make miracle worker, promise keep. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Oh, that is who you are, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory.
Lord, it was at the cross that we saw your love. Lord, we saw your passion for each and every one of us and each and every one, Lord, in this world that do not know you. And so, God, as we lift up our missionaries right now, Father, there's many names to call out. So, God, we just lift each and every one up, Lord. God, that are over there. God, the struggles that they're facing. Father, we just pray that you would just go before them, come beside them, and come up behind them, Father. That your spirit would protect them, Father God. Lord Jesus, you see them and you know them, God. If there's any, Lord, that are out there, Father, right now feeling burnt out, God, that are feeling hopeless, God, we just pray this morning that you would come beside them, God, that you would speak life into them, oh God, that they would know beyond a shadow of a doubt, God, that you are for them and not against them, oh God. And so, Lord, we bind the enemy, Lord, over their lives, over their families, God. And we pray for vision, great vision, oh God. Lord, that it would just flow over their lives today, God. And so, Lord, we bless them. We bless each and every missionary, God. We pray for provision, God. And Lord, we thank you, God, for the provision that you have provided here at Life Church for those that have stepped up today and said, yes, I'm going to give, I'm going to sacrifice so that your word, so that the gospel would go forth. Lord, we thank you, we praise you, we honor you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You may be seated. We've got one last thing we want to do. Um, and as you go out, you can place uh, that little card that you filled out into that little black, black box out there. Please do that. Um, we're excited to rebuild our missions program here. 
and we want to do that with you in agreement. Amen? In agreement. And so, um, but before we close, we have a very special birthday. And uh, so we want to ask Miss Stacy, would you come? Come on, give her a hand. <laughs> Stacy is our social media, and she takes care, social media person. She takes care of, if you follow us on Facebook, you see all the shorts TikTok, and TikTok and Instagram. And um, she does so much and is always here behind her, uh, her phone taking videos and, um, and also at all the different events getting pictures. And so she is just such a blessing and we love you so much. And so we got to sing you happy birthday. So would you sing along with me this morning as we uh, celebrate? Can we, well, you've got it here, 50 years, come on. So uh, let's sing happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Stacy. Happy birthday to you. Yeah. <laughs> we love you so much. Man, we love you so much. Well, God bless you. Hope to see you at small gatherings this week. May the Lord bless you and keep you and his face shine upon you. We'll see you soon.